Hello, uh, welcome to the Information Economy Project uh, book talk today. Uh, I am really looking forward to this. Um, my name is Tom Hazlett. I'm a professor of economics at uh, Clemson, and uh, we're delighted that we could do the program today because, you know, uh, sometimes great thoughts are out there and great books are written, but the academics at the university uh, in the university environment really don't avail themselves of uh, uh, what other people know and what uh, other people are learning. And uh, there, uh, there, there is a great example of that today. This is a talk that you won't hear every day on a university campus, uh, uh, or sometimes every year, some campuses. Uh, but Eccentric Orbits, the Iridium story, has, uh, it's a beautifully written book by an award-winning journalist and writer who's had wide experience. I read him 30 years ago as a savagely funny movie critic. And he was syndicated by the New York Times Syndicate and has gone on to a varied career. But he, he, did, uh, he did a very serious uh, job to find out what happened with, with one particular telecommunications network. And you might not think that's interesting, but I think you'd be wrong because uh, when you get into this, you'll find the fascinating stories of entrepreneurship and science, technology, politics, and uh, just, uh, you know, it's a story of our time. So we're delighted that we uh, have the opportunity to hear John Bloom, the author of Eccentric Orbits. John, I'm going to give you a screen. That's good. OK, thank you, Tom. And, uh, I assume we have some, do we have some business school students here? Two or three? Okay. Um, all right. I'm, there's only one phone that works on every inch of the planet, and it's called the Iridium phone. You can stand on the North Pole, and you can call somebody at the South Pole. You can stand in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, and you can talk to somebody on the deck of a sailboat in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And the only reason that phone exists today, saving lives all over the world because it's the only phone that works in certain places. It's the, it's the only phone that works in, in war zones. It's the only phone that works in uh, disaster areas, like the hurricane uh, sites that we've had over the last two weeks. Um, it makes business possible in remote places that have never had telephone access. It makes our soldiers safe. It makes our Marines safe in the Middle East. It allows pilots to fly polar routes to remain in contact uh, 24 hours a day. And the only reason that it exists today is that two people, one is a businessman and the other one was a White House economist, um, took chances that nobody else would take. They stood up to conventional wisdom. They said there's a better way to do things. And they were tough enough to believe in possibilities that no one else believed in. The first person is a man named Dan Colusi. He's the savior of the Iridium phone. Um, in the year 2000, when the events I'm about to describe took place, uh, Dan was happily retired and playing golf in uh, South Florida. Uh, in fact, he was just learning to play the game of golf because at the age of 69, he'd been too busy earlier in his business career to learn the game, and he actually thought it was just an excuse for businessmen to goof off, so he'd never learned to play. But um, the point I'm making is that it wasn't really corporate America that saved the Iridium phone. It was one guy who was perceptive and persistent. And the second person who rose to the occasion is with us tonight. Uh, Dorothy Robine. Raise your hand, Dorothy, so they can see you. Dorothy Robine was a special assistant in the Clinton White House um, who was pretty much the only person in the government who saw the genius of the Iridium system and believed in Dan Colusi enough to support him in what turned out to be his heroic 11th hour efforts to save, the Irid to save it. Um, now, by next year, by 2018, this same Iridium system that I'm about to describe to you will be able to track all aircraft around the world 24-7 in real time. That's going to trans transform uh, air traffic control and actually transform aviation itself. And I'll talk about that, but we'll, we'll get to all that in a minute. So 
But first, I have to tell you the story. In 1990, at the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, the Motorola Corporation, which at that time was the most powerful electronics company in the world, the only American company that could go up against the Japanese and beat the Japanese consistently, announced the most expensive and complicated engineering project in history. Now, it was more complicated than Los Alamos. People always say, what about Los Alamos? Well, it's more complicated than Los Alamos because that project was only doing one thing. The Iridium project was doing many things. And what it was is a system of 66 autonomous action satellites that would function as cell phone towers in the sky so that for the first time, every inch of the planet would be accessible by phone. Now, these were low Earth, low Earth orbit um, satellites. The satellite that you use for your direct TV, that's 22,000 miles up. These satellites are 485 miles up, so 2% of that orbit. Um, they're in six planes, six rows of satellites, 11 satellites in each plane, and they race up one side of the planet, they cross at the poles, and then they race down the other side of the planet, and they fan out at the equator, and then they go down and cross again at the south pole, and they're in a staggered pattern. Uh, one in plane one and plane three are, in, are lined up. It's a herringbone pattern, and two and four are lined up. So they can instantaneously talk to each other and make switching decisions that allow up to 12 satellites to cooperate on a single phone call. These satellites were an outgrowth of the Star Wars system, the strategic defense initiative um, of the 80s, if you remember that program. That was a system of satellites that were commissioned by President Reagan that was designed to track, track down Russian missiles, turn their own nuclear power back on those missiles, and blow them out of the air. That system was never built, but it had this one technological feature that had never been tried before. And that is that the satellites could talk to each other. They could cooperate. Now, in Star Wars, they cooperated on blowing up Russian missiles. For Iridium, they cooperated by being switchboards in space so that a phone call never has to touch an Earth station. All the switching is done in space. So this was the first system of interlinked satellites ever put, in, put into space, satellites that were essentially robots. They could make their own decisions. The telephone industry at the time thought that by today, we would all be walking around using satellite phones instead of these phones that we do use. Um, because how could they ever possibly build enough satellite uh, uh, cellular towers to cover the whole Earth? And a lot of the Earth, you can't build towers anyway. And I want to talk about that just for a minute because people don't understand it. The reason you see all these commercials on TV by Verizon and Sprint and AT&T showing their coverage map is that nobody has good coverage. Um, if you have any doubt about it, take a cross-country Amtrak train trip and see how many times your phone loses coverage on the way across the United States. Now, they can't even, so they can't even get universal coverage in the United States, which is the country that has the best coverage in the world, so you can imagine what it's like in the less developed parts of the world. Cell phones only work on 12% of the surface of the planet, and the reason for that is it's impossible to build enough cell towers. You can't put them in the middle of the ocean. You can't put them in places that have a lot of mountain peaks. Um, if you get, we have any bass fishermen here? One, Tom. Tom is the only bass fish. I mean, I'm talking at Clemson and South Carolina, and there's one bass fisherman in the audience. If you go bass fishing at Lake Hartwell, don't get too far from Interstate 85 if you want your cell phone to work. Um, uh, conventional cell phone, go ask a fisherman in the Great Lakes how, how, how well his, his cell phone works. The, the cell phones are worthless in the Great Lakes. So even if you're not in the ocean, even if you're just in a continental place that has strange terrain, your cell phone is likely not to be able to work. Plus it costs trillions and trillions of dollars just to maintain the system that we already have. You have to have a cell tower every one to five miles. It depends on the terrain. Sometimes it's one mile apart. Sometimes it's five miles apart. Um, depends on the population density. But we have a trillion dollars invested already in cell phone towers, and they break down all the time. A hurricane can take them out, obviously. A tornado can take them out. 
Just severe thunderstorms can take them out. And they're extremely dangerous. So many people get killed or permanently injured working on cell towers that there are entire law firms that just live off the liability cases for that. When you have any kind of natural disaster or a terrorist situation, the first thing that fails is the cell phone system. And if you ask people in Florida this week, in Texas last week, what are you panicking about in the aftermath of a hurricane? It's not, will I have food and water? It's, will my smartphone work? And the answer is no, your smartphone will not work. Some of you may have seen the CNN reporter uh, 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 yesterday who's going through the Florida Keys and he's handing a phone to the families who were cut off from their loved ones and he's standing there as they cry and get all emotional because they're talking to him for the first time in days. And the CNN anchor says, well, that's wonderful that we have that equipment that people can use. Well, that equipment has a name. That name is the Iridium phone. It's one of a kind. And uh, when it was first offered to CNN back in 1999, they said, why would we need that? You know, so uh, apparently they got the memo now. But um, today CNN carries them as standard safety equipment whenever they go into a disaster zone, as does the Red Cross, as does 300 other disaster relief agencies and almost every media organization. So the Motorola idea made a lot of sense, made sense then, and it actually makes sense today. So they built this system, the system worked, it was acclaimed by systems engineers all over the world, and so why, when I meet Dan Colusi 19 years later, in 2009, have I never heard of Iridium? I've never heard of this system. I met Dan Colusi through a mutual friend, and he was interested in having somebody read through his memoirs and edit them for him, and um, I agreed to do that, and in the course of that, he told me the Iridium story, and I said, wait, what? Tell me that again. I have to hear that again. He tells me the, the story again. I said, they did what? He was just telling me the general outlines of what happened, and it had all these stories about the Pentagon and the Clinton White House and the Secretary of Defense and a telephone company in Saudi Arabia that was partly owned by the bin Laden group. And all of that was fascinating, but the main thing he showed me was he showed me this 3D file of the satellites in motion. And they were beautiful. Now, engineers are not normally a romantic sort. Uh, but I have a passage in the book because the, about the huge number of people over the years who fell in love with these satellites. And that's the language they would use. They would say, I loved those satellites. My satellites were gorgeous. They would frequently call them my satellites, you know, as, as, as though they were in love. Now, in their more sober moments, they would say, elegant. It was an elegant constellation of satellites, which I understand that the word elegant is pretty much the highest praise that one engineer ever gives to another engineer. But um, most people, when they think of satellites, they think of them as reflectors. They're reflectors for TV signals or radio signals, and they hover over the equator in, the, um, in, a, in a geostationary orbit. And that is 90% of the satellites. But these are in low Earth orbit. Um, uh, they're traveling over the poles not around the equator, and the same satellite passes over the North Pole 14 times a day, travels at 17,000 miles an hour, and in the course of its journey, because the Earth is rotating underneath that orbit, it will pass over every inch of the Earth's surface. And the signal is instantaneous. It's not like those TV reporters. I don't know why they're still using those, those uh, uh, connections where the reporter is trying to talk to the anchor desk and they have a four second delay to get the questions back <laughs> between the two people talking. This, the Iridium uh, signal is instantaneous. So I heard this story about one of the most amazing engineering projects of the last century that became the biggest bankruptcy in American history. Now it was the year before Enron and so the record got broken really fast. But at the time, if you ask a Wall Street guy, what do you remember about Iridium? He'll say, oh, a huge flame out. Oh, that's, that's that thing that Motorola screwed up. Motorola wanted to crash those things into the ocean. I remember that. They should have crashed those things into the ocean. So I'm hearing this bipolar story, in other words. Because on the one hand, yes, it's the greatest engineering project in history. On the other hand, it's the biggest bankruptcy in history. 
And, but I'm hearing it years after the main events. And so I tell Dan Calusi, look, I'm going to go off for a while, and I'm going to talk to people associated with Iridium and Motorola, find out what this is, and I ask all the obvious questions. And there are a, are a remarkable number of people who refuse to talk to me. Now, nothing makes a reporter more interested in a story than people refusing to talk. So Bill Clinton won't talk about it and won't let his people talk about it. Al Gore, who was even more involved than Bill Clinton, he won't talk about it. Um, the Secretary of Defense at the time, Bill Cohen, he definitely did not want to talk about it. 90% um, of the people involved at the Motorola Corporation did not want to talk about this story. So who wanted to talk about it? The engineers wanted to talk about it. The scientists wanted to talk about it. The civil servants wanted to talk about it. The bureaucrats in Washington wanted to talk about it. And what, the, what they would say was startling. For example, you, the first question, the first obvious question is, how does this happen? How do you eat through $11 billion in nine months and bankrupt a company that has been in the works for 12 years? Well, maybe it was because the phone weighed about a pound, and it was a brick long after the age of the brick had passed. Uh, Motorola, by the way, had invented the cell phone, the original brick, called the Dynatac. Do you remember that? Um, uh, uh, remember the movie Wall Street? He carried one around the entire movie. Um, but the Iridium phone resembled a World War II walkie-talkie with a giant antenna. So it was not just a brick. It was a brick with a baguette sticking out of it, and it sold for $3,500. So maybe that was part of the reason. And then there was the business plan. Motorola was seeking this elusive creature called the international business traveler, the guy who needs to be connected no matter where he goes in the world. But by the time they developed the phone, that guy had been blessed with a slim phone that worked on the GSM model, um, and therefore it was capable of roaming. Roaming was a new thing at the time. Roaming was one of the most unpopular fees ever imposed on the consumer, but when you needed roaming, roaming worked. So the GSM phone didn't work everywhere, like Iridium, didn't work in the ocean, didn't work at the South Pole, it wasn't global, it just worked in the places where the people are. So eventually I asked the question, who came up with this whole idea in the first place? And the answer to that was very interesting. Three engineers in the most obscure part of the Motorola Corporation, so obscure they called it Motorola Siberia, the Chandler Lab in Chandler, Arizona, had figured out this 66 satellite constellation that would cover the Earth, they figured out the proper heights of the orbits, how the phones could connect when they're traveling at such high speeds, because normally with a cell phone, either the tower is stationary or the phone is stationary. You know, if you have a, you can have a suitcase phone where it's talking to satellites, but the phone itself doesn't move. So normally you either have a moving phone or a, or, 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 or a moving cell tower. In this case, you've got a, you've got a moving phone and a moving cell tower. And sometimes the cell tower is moving at 17,000 miles an hour, and the phone's moving at 600 miles an hour because it's in the cockpit of an airplane. And so they had to work out the algorithms for that, and they were just nightmarish to, to figure that out. But these three engineers, working alone, working really against the whole culture of their corporation, working in an environment where people kept telling them that what they were doing was garbage, you know, um, they painstakingly developed the design of something that had never before been attempted. Just the number of rocket launches they had to have to get these things up there was groundbreaking. They were going to need 17 launches. Nobody in private industry had ever launched that many rockets. And because they had to use rockets from Russia and China, those launches had to be coordinated in three countries, including two countries where Americans had never even been allowed to see the launch facility. So why, did they, why would they spend this money on such a big project? Because Ray Leopold, the chief engineer, and his colleagues believed that the future of the world would have millions and millions of people walking around using satellite phones. So my next question is, well, why didn't the rest of the world think that? The rest of the world did think that. There were at least a dozen satellite phone companies formed in the early 90s, including one created by Bill Gates and Craig McCaw, 
called the teledesic system. And that system would have provided internet in the sky besides a, a voice phone. So what happened to those companies? You know, they went bankrupt too. <laughs> so why, did, why is Iridium the one company that survived? Because of that one man, Dan Calusi, the retired businessman playing golf in Palm Beach, a man with no previous experience in satellite communications, no previous experience with any kind of outer space project, a man who had no money of his own to buy the system. But one thing I've learned through dozens of hours of interviews with Dan Calusi is he's one of the best listeners I've ever known. Now, I've, been, I've interviewed a lot of businessmen, good ones, bad ones, evil ones, aggressive ones, modest ones. And every great businessman that I've ever interviewed is a great listener. He does not talk as much as he lets other people talk. So Dan Calusi was the ultimate in this category. He, often you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice him if you went into the room. He would be the, you know, the, not the first person that you would notice. But he was exposed to a lot of uh, related industries. He sat on a lot of uh, boards of directors. He knew enough about aerospace to know that a lot of what was being said about the satellites was more about panic than about reason. He had worked, he had been president at one time of Pan American Airways. Pan American Airways, people don't remember this. People in foreign countries remember this more than Americans do, but Pan American Airways was the largest airline in the world for decades. And when he had worked there, uh, they had a constant problem. They served 121 cities in 84 countries. And the communication system was this patchwork quilt of phones, radios, cables, telegraphs. And it worked most of the time, but it would have been a thousand times smoother if he could have just parked an Iridium phone in every cockpit. So Calusi's saying, the airline executives are going to love this. You know, he's telling everyone, just the airline executives alone are going to want to put this in every plane in the world. He was completely wrong about that. Airline executives are not the most aggressive people in the world. They don't, they don't embrace change quickly. But he set out to save the constellation. OK, so from my point of view, when people don't want to talk to you, what do you do? You go get their email. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request. And the result is that they turned up 18,000 pages of documents dealing with Iridium all housed at the William Jefferson Clinton Library in Little Rock, Arkansas. And then they were teasing me. They wouldn't give them to me. Uh, Clinton has to read these first. Oh, give me a break. Clinton's not going to read these. Well, he has people that read stuff for him before it gets released. And then Obama has to read these too, you know. Uh, and, you know, so every month I would talk to him. Next month, next month, next month. The Pentagon has to clear these. Some of them are national security, you know. Um, this agency has to read them. You know, Obama hadn't read them yet. This went on forever. In fact, I was finally going to write the book without the documents, although I just the, the idea of 18,000 documents is driving me crazy. And then finally, lo and behold, they released 17,000 of the 18,000 pages of documents. Okay, that's the good news. The bad news is, I'm now on a plane to Little Rock, Arkansas, to read 17,000 pages of government documents, including hundreds of pages of handwritten notes. Uh, and that's when I discovered Dorothy Robine. Dorothy's official title at the White House was Special Assistant to the President. And she was known in the White House uh, Economic Policy Office as a problem solver, a troubleshooter, uh, especially in all these areas that were dominated traditionally by men, like shipbuilding, military bases, aerospace, international telecommunications. So at the Clinton Library, I find these hundreds of pages of yellow legal paper, handwritten, no dates on it. Thank you, Dorothy, for that. You know, <laughs> in the future, please, please put dates. You know, when you're going to scribble that stuff, put a date on the top. You know, it takes two seconds. Um, phone calls, meetings, fact-seeking uh, fact sessions, uh, fights in the White House situation room, you know, very dramatic stuff. And so what I gather from the hours it took to decipher these notes is that a government employee is fighting the various people at the White House, 
the Pentagon, and a dozen other government agencies who apparently don't care if the most complex engineering project in history is destroyed. In fact, Dorothy was told by the White House legal office, don't get involved in this bankruptcy. Limit yourself to safety issues. And thank God for future events, Dorothy just decides to ignore the White House lawyer <laughs> and set out to help save the satellites from imminent destruction because that's exactly what was about to happen. Motorola has created the satellites. They've created a multinational corporation to market the satellites. They've formed partnerships with businessmen and governments all over the world. It's the first global corporation representing every country in the world, but now their business plan has failed. In fact, to show you how, what a global corporation it is, it has a country code. Iridium itself is a country, <laughs> you know, when you dial the number. So their business plan has failed, so they just decide to crash it into the ocean. And uh, actually, they couldn't guarantee that they would crash the satellites into the ocean because they were extremely lightweight satellites. They were just 1,400 pounds, so they were just going to flutter around in the atmosphere and come down wherever they please. Enter Dan Colusi. Colusi decides on his own he will not let this happen, and he starts putting together a group of um, investors that can try to buy the satellites out of bankruptcy and use them. But he doesn't know what to use them for. It, it's a kind of, this is, you know how they always talk about supply side economics? This is panicky demand side economics. You have to know where the demand is for this product. But it's a thorny, complicated problem that you would normally study for months, if not years. He had weeks, if not days. Uh, in fact, when he first became involved, he was told, you have exactly nine days before these satellites are destroyed. So he calls on his Harvard Business School background, and he asks the question, where is the customer? Not the potential customer. Where is the person who cannot live without this phone? Obviously, it's not the international business traveler. Um, who needs this phone? And the answer is very interesting. CIA agents needed this phone, especially when they were working alone. Drug enforcement agents needed it even more, especially the ones working in the jungles of Colombia, because the drug dealers already had their iridium phones. So their opponents had the iridium phones, and our DEA agents did not have them. Marines in small units in Bosnia during the Balkan Wars, they loved these phones. Oil exploration companies that work in remote places, small craft on the open sea, fishermen, mining companies in the most isolated parts of Africa, trekkers at the North Pole, uh, but especially guys with secret identities who sneak across borders in the dead of night wanted these phones. So Dan Colusi says, okay, it's a no-brainer. The Pentagon is who needs these phones. Obviously, you guys want the phone, right? He goes to the Pentagon. Obviously, you guys want the phone. Nope, not interested. The military, he's told by these generals, the military uses secure phones that we own, that we run, that are based at Cheyenne Mountain, not phones that anybody can buy that were invented for playboys in Monaco. And the Navy was especially negative towards the idea of using these civilian phones um, uh, more than they already had. But a strange thing happened when he went to the Pentagon. When he made his first visit, this enthusiastic, youthful civilian suddenly shows up to, are you Mr. Colusi? I, I'm here to guide you through the process. Weird. His name was Mark Adams, and he was a man with very strange credentials from the MITRE Corporation. Now, the MITRE Corporation is a place where they do secret research for the government. It was originally created in the 1950s um, when President Eisenhower gave the order to automate war bring computers into war. If, you, if, if any of you have seen the movie Dr. Strangelove, those giant computers, they're called the Sage computers, those were created by the MITRE Corporation. At any rate, the MITRE Corporation has always been a favorite uh, bogeyman of conspiracy theorists, especially since it's where the internet was invented, and because almost all the CEOs of the MITRE Corporation are ex-heads of the CIA. So this guy from the MITRE Corporation shows up out of nowhere, and uh, normally, when you go to the Pentagon, by the way, you have, to sit, you, you have to sit around all day waiting on your meeting. 
but suddenly this miter guy's there to, quote, guide you through the process. So Colusi had been president of Pan Am in the 70s when terrorists were regularly hijacking his planes. <laughs> and so he was somewhat familiar with government agents, and his spook detector went off, and he thought, okay, somebody is watching this process, somebody is on my side, and from there the story starts to get stranger and stranger and stranger, because the spies definitely wanted the phone, but the generals did not want the phone. The Marines at Camp Pendleton, who are the first responders in, whenever we go to, to, into battle, they wanted the phone because it worked on the move and it was handheld. They already had three communications devices that they used when they hit the beaches, but none of them worked on the move. You had to stop, and then the communications officer had to set up the device, and then you establish contact with headquarters. The Iridium phone was handheld. You could use it while you were running down the, uh, uh, the beach. Um, in fact, Iridium would later prove indispensable in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, the guys in charge of operations at the South Pole, the scientists, uh, they were begging for this phone. <laughs> so let me put this in context. You've got a satellite constellation that's conservatively estimated to be worth six and a half billion dollars. It's about to be destroyed by its operator, the Motorola Corporation, at a time when any Fortune 500 corporation could acquire it for pocket change. But there's no bidders, the military is not inclined to help, or at least the top levels of the military are not inclined to help. I don't understand this, but I asked Dorothy about this. I said, because well, Dorothy says, well, it wasn't, that, it wasn't that the military didn't want to help. It was the three stars and the four stars who were the problem. And I said, what are you telling me? The three stars and the four stars didn't want to help, but the one stars and the two stars did want to help? And she says, I don't know. I never talked to the one and the two stars. So, uh, so I don't know. But anyway, Dan Calusi, he, Dan Calusi goes to Motorola, at their world headquarters in Chicago, and he says, I'll, I'll get this out of bankruptcy because you guys can't be serious. You're not going to des uh, destroy this, are you? And Motorola scoffs at him. They say, surely you don't think you can use this thing for data. He actually did have a plan to use it for data, and it's used for data today. But he goes to all the other co-owners of Iridium, the partners of Motorola, 28 companies around the world, they're in a rage because they feel like Motorola sold them this white elephant and um, it's a worthless company now. So none of them will put up the money to get it out of bankruptcy. He goes to every service provider in the world, tells them, look, you can own this system for pennies on the dollar. It actually turned out to be fractions of pennies on the dollar, but nobody knew that yet. And nobody was willing to take a chance on, on the system. He goes to an investment banker that he's known for 35 years, one of his classmates at Harvard Business. That guy promises to put up enough money to buy the system out of bankruptcy and run it for one year, and then at the last minute, he backs out very publicly, issues a statement to the New York Times, and says in his estimation, the system is worthless. In fact, that statement was so public that the State Department formally informed Russia that non-nuclear debris would be coming out of the sky. You have to tell Russia any time any kind of debris is going to come out of the sky. So they made that formal notification of Russia so that they didn't mistake the falling satellites for incoming missiles. Meanwhile, the government is in a panic. A dozen agencies are writing memos, making plans for the moment when 88 satellites, because they, it wasn't just the 66, they had spares up there. So 88 satellites are going to be jolted out of their flight path and allowed to plunge to Earth. Especially annoyed by this is President Clinton, who says, oh, I'm not going to let that happen. That's not going to take place on my watch, only to be informed by his lieutenants that he has no authority over the satellites because they were launched entirely by private industry. And in fact, there are foreign governments that are owners of the system, including China and Russia. So Chinese, China and Russia have more control over this because the Pentagon is a mere customer of this system. The only person who does not give up and constantly warns the government not to get ahead of itself is Dorothy Robine, wor slavishly working at the, at the White House. And then listen to this part carefully because you're not going to believe this part. The owner of the Black Entertainment Network asked one of his female talk show hostesses to set up a meeting 
with the Secretary of Defense so that some friends of Jesse Jackson can buy the Iridium system to provide phone service to villages in Africa. Now, you may not have followed all of that. The female talk show hostess at the Black Entertainment Network was married to the Secretary of Defense, so that explains that part of it. But Bob Johnson, founder of the Black Entertainment Network, and some of you may know him because when they, when they, um, uh, when the Charlotte Bobcats were created, no longer the Bobcats, right? But originally they were the Bobcats. Um, Bob Johnson, the first uh, black billionaire, bought the Bobcats, and he later sold them to uh, Michael Jordan. But anyway, Bob Johnson comes to the aid of a group of African-American investors, all friends of Jesse Jackson, who don't like the way Dan Calusi is being treated, and they think, well, we can use that Iridium system for communications in remote African villages. Hence, one of the strangest business partnerships in history is formed between all the uh, 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 liberal, socially-minded African-American businessmen of Washington, D.C., and the most conservative Palm Beach Republicans you've ever met in your life, and they say, let's get together and let's solve this problem. But they still don't have enough money, and so they seek additional funding from a Saudi Arabian prince, and the story gets stranger and stranger. So to do this book, the book that I ended up writing, I went on this journey that took me all over the country, and I interviewed some, just a few of the thousands of people that were involved with the Iridium Project, and the way the story plays out is full of twists and turns and dirty tricks and revenge and a sort of secret history of the four or five people who saved Iridium. But I wanted to wind up my remarks with a few things that were just amazing to me about this story. And I've seen a lot as a journalist, but these things were amazing to me. There's a lot of rocket science in the book. Don't be turned off by that, because I explain it. Um, because of the complexity of the Iridium constellation, the satellites had to be launched in combinations of seven, five, and two. So seven on a rocket, five on a rocket, and two on a rocket in order to get them into the places they're supposed to be in the, in the planes in outer space. The chief rocket guy, a man named Danny Stamp, had worked in the Air Force doing spy satellites all his life, and he hated American rockets. He said they don't, they, they don't work, they're not dependable. He loved Russian rockets. He loved the Proton the largest rocket in the world at the time. Um, it was the only rocket in the world large enough to carry uh, seven satellites at a time into space. He also loved a Chinese rocket called the Long March that was perfect for the two satellite launches. Well, he, so he says, we're launching the whole, he tells his bosses at Motorola, we're launching the whole thing on Russian and Chinese rockets. And Motorola goes, no, 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 no. We're not doing, we're not taking that publicity hit you're not doing that. You got to at least have one American rocket. Um, so they put pressure on him, and reluctantly, he decided to use the Delta II rocket, which was owned by McDonnell Douglas. McDonnell Douglas was later bought by Boeing. And uh, that Delta II rocket was used for the five satellite launches. So launches were made from three countries the United States, Kazakhstan, which is where the Russians do their major launches, and China. Now, most people think if you have a major launch of that type in America, you do it from Cape Canaveral, right? No, you can't do this from Cape Canaveral. You do this from Vandenberg Air Force Base in Lompoc, California. Now, most people have never heard of Vandenberg or been there or know much about it, but Vandenberg has a lot more space launches than Cape Canaveral, uh, but most of them are secret, and that's why you don't hear about it, because they're either spy satellites are there those nuclear delivery rockets that are aimed at that poor island in the Pacific that we've, we've pretty much blown to smithereens, that island, Kwajalein Island. That's the, so we, hit, we keep hitting this one island over and over again. And the reason Vandenberg figures in this book is that it's the only place where you can legally do polar orbits as opposed to equatorial orbits. So the 66 Iridium satellites are in polar orbit. It's actually illegal to launch a polar orbit from Cape Canaveral because if you were launching to the north, you'd have to, actually you would have to fly over Greenville. <laughs> now that I think about it, if you're launching to the north uh, from uh, Cape Canaveral, you would fly over uh, uh, Greenville and Charlotte and Buffalo and Toronto. 
Uh, if you were launching to the south, you'd fly over Quito and Bogota. So uh, the United States thinks it's a bad idea to uh, launch low-flying rockets over major population centers. Believe me, you don't want a low-flying uh, Delta II uh, uh, coming over downtown Greenville. So, but many of the iridium satellites were launched from China. And in China, they don't care. You know, they'll, they'll go right over the cities. And in fact, in the 90s, they apparently wiped out a couple of villages. We've never been able to find out exactly what happened, but they just continued to make those launches over populous areas. So anyway, Vandenberg Air Force Base sits out on a peninsula that juts out in the Pacific Ocean. Um, you've probably heard of, you've probably been to Vandenberg Air Force Base, Tom, because Tom is from LA. Who's from LA? You're the only person I've ever met that's from, from LA. Anyway, Tom knows where Vandenberg is. It's on this peninsula that juts out into the Pacific Ocean. And so when you do the polar launch, the first landmass you cross is, is in Antarctica. So that's why they use it. And the only city that's in danger is Lompoc, California itself. Um, so the Air Force made a deal with Lompoc, California that they have a safety standard. Six dead civilians. That's the maximum you can have, six dead civilians. Uh, seven dead civilians is too many. So, and this is apparently okay with the people of Lompoc, all except the six dead ones. So, so, but the most reliable rocket in the world both then and now, is the Proton, the Russian rocket. So Danny Stamp was one of the first Americans ever to go to the Baikonur Cosmodrome after the end of the Cold War. Now, the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, in the middle of nowhere, is a sacred place to rocket people and space people, and it's just this fabled uh, uh, city that was uh, built by the Soviets in the early 50s and is the longest operating space center in the world. And so uh, Danny goes there by himself, you know, to check it out before we're going to do this deal with the Russians. And uh, he starts to realize this is not like we do it in America. There's like all kinds of traditions here that I've never seen before. For example, when a rocket blows up on the launch pad, they just leave it. it they leave it. And it, it, they leave it to the elements. It's dangerous. You know, something bad happened there. They leave it to the elements, and so the wind and the rain and everything starts making it look like an archaeological ruin. And so it just stays there out in the desert. Um, when you go to the launch pad at Baikonur Cosmodrome, you, you get on a bus, and the bus goes three kilometers out to the launch pad. Halfway there, the bus stops. And this is all men. There's no women at Baikonur Cosmodrome. Halfway there, the bus stops. And everybody gets off the bus and goes to the right rear tire and urinates on the right rear tire. Uh, why do they do this? Because Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, did that, and he survived. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Danny is there, and he's having a good time, and he's sharing vodka, and he likes vodka, and he's making all these new Russian friends. And uh, on one of the last days that he's there, he says, uh, you know, uh, before I leave, I need to see the control room where my men will be working when we do this launch. And the Russians say, oh, you want to see the control room? He says, yeah. And the Russians go off in the corner, and they kind of mumble among themselves, and they're whispering. And they come back, and they say, well, we really can't show you the control room, but we can show you another control room that's exactly like the control room where your men will be working. And Danny says, well, no, I don't think I can do that. I do have to see the actual place where my men will be working. The Russians go off, they talk among themselves, they're whispering, they're you know, debating. They come back and they say, okay, we're gonna show you the control room, but on the way to the control room, you're gonna walk through another room. And when you walk through that room, we would appreciate it if you will walk as fast as possible and look directly down at the ground and not move your head in either direction. And so the hairs on Danny's neck is going to stand up. And I say, so what did you do, Danny? And he said, I walked as slow as possible, and I moved my head as much as I could to see everything in that room. <laughs> and I said, and what did you see? And he said, I saw on one wall a huge map of the former Soviet Union, and at the top of that wall, an upside-down map of Canada and the United States, and blinking uh, lights all over the map showing the location of every active ICBM in the world. And I said, what does that mean, Danny? And he says, they took me through the war room, and for whatever paranoid reason, they were on active alert. And I said, so what did you do? And he says, 
I said, let's have some more vodka. You know, we were the first global corporation. We had to get along. <laughs> so, um, by the way, the satellites still fly, of course. Uh, there's a second generation going up. Uh, the first two launches uh, have gone up on, the, on Elon Musk's Falcon 9 rocket, the SpaceX company. Um, there, this uh, technology has advanced, so now you can put 10, uh, 10 satellites. The satellites are smaller, so the next generation you can put 10 satellites in the nose cone of a Falcon 9 rocket. So 20 of the new satellites are already up. More satellite, uh, the third launch will be in October. Um, all of those first-generation problems, like the size of the handset, were overcome. It has become one of the most reliable devices in the world for things like asset tracking. With a device this big, you can track any piece of machinery, wherever it is, anywhere on the planet. Um, most people know the Iridium phone, if they know the Iridium phone at all, they know it from the movies. Uh, Robert Downey Jr. uses an Iridium phone in all the Iron Man movies. That phone he's using is an Iridium phone. Uh, Clive Custler in the Dirk Pitt stories uh, has Iridium phones throughout the stories. Brad Pitt fights zombies and saves the world with an Iridium phone in World War Z. You may remember that. But the one scene that everyone can kind of identify with that they always remember that uses an Iridium phone is um, Bradley Cooper in... Um, American Sniper. If you remember, near the end of the movie, he executes the longest kill shot in history. And uh, he's uh, a little shaky after doing that. I think the shot went a mile and a half. Um, and uh, he, um, he uh, puts down his gun and he picks up his iridium phone and he extends a little antenna on it and he says, I'm ready to come home now, baby. And that's probably, everyone remembers that phone, that uh, scene as the, and of course they love the scene at Iridium. Um, there were three events though that made Iridium famous and made it essential for the, for the world. Uh, on 9-11, uh, the Iridium phone was the only phone that worked in Manhattan for quite some time. Um, um, Hurricane Katrina, uh, the entire communications infrastructure of southern Louisiana was knocked out. Um, the only phone that worked was the Iridium phone. Many of were flown in so that FEMA could use them, so the Red Cross could use them. Um, and Afghanistan, even more than, uh, more than Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Afghanistan has such weird terrain that virtually no communication systems work, but the Iridium phone works there. If you ever see a soldier in an airport and you say, have you ever used the Iridium phone? He'll say, oh my God, I love the Iridium phone, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, saved, many, saved many a life. Um, there are Iridium traditions now. It used to be, if you climbed Mount Everest, when you got to the top of Mount Everest, you either put a flag of your country there, or you put a flag of your symbol, of your co uh, the company that paid you to climb a Everest or whatever, but you put some kind of flag up there. Now what you do is you dial somebody on your Iridium phone and you say, guess where I am? <laughs> uh, the same thing is true at the South Pole. Uh, when, you go to the, when you arrive at the South Pole, they actually have an Iridium phone there just so a visitor can use it to say, hey, guess where I am? You can't really do it at the North Pole because there's, no, there's shifting ice and you never know exactly where you are at the North Pole. Um, it's standard safety equipment, as I mentioned, for many, many corporations for all kinds of aid organizations all over the world. And none of these things would have been possible were it not for the heroic efforts of Dorothy uh, and, and her fellow plotters in the government. And um, because on Labor Day weekend in the year 2000, uh, Danny Stamp had been summoned to Motorola World Headquarters in Schaumburg, Illinois, and he was told that as soon as you receive a call from the uh, um, company's CEO, uh, we expect you to deorbit the constellation. They always use that euphemism. They always say that it's a deorbit. Or they would say decommission the system. They, they uh, liquidate the non-performing assets or something. They never said we're going to destroy them <laughs> or we're going to knock them out of the sky. But the suicide software had been written. They were just waiting on a single fax from 
an insurance company in Belgium, and then Danny was supposed to call the uh, Mission Control Center in Virginia, and they would use the hydro, they have a hydrazine thruster on the, each satellite that's usually uh, used to make small adjustments and keep the satellite in place. They were going to use that to knock each satellite out of orbit. And then uh, Dorothy, who was working, this was a Sunday afternoon of Labor Day weekend, Dorothy was at the White House working on Sunday afternoon. She tracked down a Motorola executive at a baseball game, and she told him, because she'd made some previous calls, and she said, I really think you should come to the Pentagon on Tuesday morning. And of course, the executive was, why is this, why, you know, how, why are you bothering me? Um, you know, the thing's already been ordered. It may be too late by Tuesday morning. Surely you can wait one more day. Please be at this meeting on Tuesday morning at the Pentagon. It will be in your interest. Um, and so at the 59th minute of the 11th hour, the constellation was saved. Uh, and Dan Colusi's little misfit group of investors got the system out of bankruptcy for, it was supposed to be for $25 million cash. But he didn't have $25 million. <laughs> he, he, he needed $18 million of the 25 in order to have 100 so he could run the system for one year. And so he told Chase Manhattan Bank, I'm going to pay you the 25, but I don't have it right now. So can I pay you six and a half and you write me a loan for the other uh, 18 and a half? What were they going to say? <laughs> you know, so they said, okay. So, uh, he, so actually for $6.5 million cash for a $6.5 billion system, um, they managed to get the system out of bankruptcy and run it on a shoestring for four years, scrimping and saving until a day in May of 2004 when they knew, finally knew, oh my God, this is going to work. Now what happened, uh, this was also a Sunday afternoon, suddenly at the operating center in Virginia, um, they had all these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of drop calls, like the system was maxed out. And they're, they're looking at the uh, computer screens and they're saying, how can this be happening? How can this be happening? And they're getting complaints and uh, they call out to the, to the ground station in Tempe, Arizona, where all the calls come to earth, you know, and they're like, oh, you have this same thing? Yeah, we got the same problem, you know. Well, they can't max out. We don't have enough phones in service to max the system out. And then they, they're looking closer and closer at the data and it says, oh, yeah, well, you can max it out if all the calls are going to one satellite. Well, the one satellite that was getting the calls every nine minutes as, as the different satellites passed over was right over Baghdad because you had 148,000 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines uh, stationed in Iraq and they all had to get a call through during daylight hours at the same time, even though they weren't supposed to be using the Iridium phone for a morale call, it was Mother's Day. So the only thing that can max out the Iridium system is Mother's Day in a war zone. <laughs> a few months after that, a business writer for USA Today was trying to come up with a comparison for a business deal for that little money that resulted in a permanent resource that's worth a billion dollars or more, and the only one he could come up with was the Louisiana Purchase. So it has a happy ending. I love happy endings like that. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you, Tom. I want to thank Tom Hazlett and um, uh, the Economics Department and the Clemson Business School for letting me tell this story. Um, the three business students we have here tonight, <laughs> I know you guys are going to be out there changing the world. I have enormous respect for uh, business leaders, and I wanted everyone to hear this story about another businessman from another generation. By the way, Dan Colusi is still running three companies. He's uh, 86 years old now. Um, uh, but this, this businessman from another generation proved that being a businessman is not about how much money you have but how clearly you think. And because uh, when Dan Colusi set out to save the system, he was mostly thinking it was a great asset that had monetary value. But in the course of pursuing that goal, he actually created a resource that no one would want the world to live without today. And um, this upcoming marriage, by the way, of the Iridium system with the air traffic control systems of the world 
means we'll never again have an Amelia Earhart situation or we'll never again have a disappearing Malaysian airliner because these Iridium satellites will always be sending back information telling us exactly where the planes are. Um, and even more optimistically, maybe uh, the aircraft won't go down to begin with because the eyes and ears of Iridium will see what's happening and allow adjustments to be made long before we have any loss of life. And I think all of this proves that the American economic system, to get a little patriotic here at the end, the American economic system, even in cases of bankruptcy, because other countries don't have this bankruptcy system, even in cases of bankruptcy, the American system is working because it rewards the guys who have the best vision for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we can do questions. Yeah. Why don't you go back up? Yeah. Please uh, say your name and um, here. Yeah, why don't we do that? Uh, I'm John Saylor, uh, Clemson University of Mechanical Engineering Department. I love your talk, and I, I love the I've followed the Iridium story for a while. Um, but wouldn't you agree that, you know, a real issue with this is the low Earth orbit itself? I mean, you have drag on the, on the atmosphere. It slows things down. So you constantly have to boost orbit, which you don't have to do with, you know, geosynchronous satellites and whatnot. And my impression from reading about this from years ago was that that was just always going to keep the cost high because you've got to pop satellites up just because you run out of fuel to keep them in that low orbit and deal with the drag on the on the atmosphere. Is that not true, or is the economic That's not true at all. What you, what you were reading... Could you, for the people who aren't engineers, yeah. talk a little bit about geosynchronous... Well, the idea is that with these low Earth orbits, take a lot of money to keep, keep the orbit uh, uh, perfect. Um, um, and that was the... Uh, Motorola, in all of its financial filing, Motorola was a very... Uh, one of the most powerful com companies in the world and pretty much did whatever it wanted to do. Um, it, was, it was a very macho company, and they believed that they were a privileged company and that they could do things the way they wanted to do things. And one of the things they did was they created all the rules of how uh, the system would be judged in the future. And the way it would be judged is they were going to make this satellite, they had a contract to replace the satellites every five years, because that was going to be the life of the satellites, five years. And they had a contracts to operate the system, and that was going to require X number of money. They had three uh, amazingly lucrative contracts. They exaggerated the difficulty so much. The engineers knew that the system was very robust, very resilient, very lightweight, therefore much easier to keep in the orbit than, than you might think it would be, um, and that the life of the satellites was not five years. The life of the satellites was 20 or 25 years because so many redundancies were built into the engineering at every stage from all the years that they were developing the system. And so Colusi, be, himself being a former engineer, um, knew that redundancies are always built into a system, especially a system this large, and he got enough expert advice from the guy, the grunts on the ground who had actually built the system. They, they say, you know, Motorola did those obscene contracts so that they could send up new satellites every five years to replace the perfectly good satellites, you know, so they could get more money, <laughs> you know. And, uh, you know, they said that after they'd left Motorola, of course. But... Um, uh, but uh, no, the system proved amazingly resilient. The, the, uh, there was one very fortunate decision. When they were trying to lessen the weight, lessen the weight, lessen the weight, when they, you know, to get the lightest satellite possible. And so they only needed about um, uh, 20 gallons of fuel for what they call station keeping, to keep the satellite on the proper orbit. Uh, but they're, they were trying to buy off-the-shelf tanks. In other words, instead of designing a tank and building it, you know, whatever was available out there. So there was a, there was a 15 and there was a 200. So they had a 
gallon tank. And so as they're starting to launch the system, uh, half of the engineers are saying, don't put 200 gallons in that tank. It's too much weight. It's too much weight. We're already testing the limits of the Delta II rocket. The Russian rocket's fine, but the Delta II rocket, we shouldn't test those limits. Don't, don't put 200. And Danny Stamp says, fuel in space is more precious <laughs> than life itself. And he fights and fights and fights and fights. And finally, the guy who was in charge of the whole system, he says, OK, fill up the tanks. And so they end up with 200, with 10 times the amount of fuel that they need. And so they're able to, when something failed, there was, there was a, a mechanical part that did fail that uh, uh, pushes against the solar winds. It failed on some of the satellites. They just used that hydrazine thruster to push it, nudge it back into space, nudge it back into space. So um, no, I, and I mean, everything they learned you know, they were able to incorporate into the second generation, and they're still incredibly light satellites. They're still incredibly, um, uh, um, you know, uh, they're going to be robust. They think these may not have to be replaced until 2040, something like that, you know. So, um, uh, so I think there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of publicity that was uh, uh, intended to generate Motorola business, but was was not valid. Yeah. Uh, Bill Delaney from the Advanced Materials Research Lab at Clemson. Um, with the number of satellites in the constellation currently, um, what, if you know, what are the number of potential users to, before the system max out with its bandwidth? Number, number of phone calls they can take? Uh, the number of phones being used. Uh, number of phones? Total. Um, they have about a million phones out there now, uh, and they haven't come anywhere close to uh, maxing out the system. If they ever, if they ever did max max out the system, they can put one more plane of satellites up. Uh, you put 11, 11 more satellites, you have one additional plane. Um, the um, uh, uh, the number of satellites you can put up is unlimited. In fact. Um, uh, they have a program called Iridium Prime. If you want a satellite of your own <laughs> in the Iridium system to take pictures, to do, you know, whatever, to put sensitive scientific equipment on, whatever, uh, they will uh, ease it into the system for you, you know. And um, so they thought that the government would love that, and they thought that NOAA and other agencies like that uh, they thought that the uh, NSA would want it because um, uh, you have these 66 satellites. You can point cameras up instead of down so that you can see every other space vehicle uh, that's in the skies. They thought that the government might want that. <laughs> you know, they thought Google Maps would, would, would want a satellite. Google Maps uses data that's uh, uh, as much as two years old. Uh, when, they, when you go to Google Earth, um, Google passed on it. So, um, but, um, uh, you know, does that answer the question? Yeah. yeah. How, how do they deal with the, uh, the clutter that's up there? Are they low enough um, in the orbit? The clutter in the space garbage? Um, actually, they don't always deal with it because an, an out of control Russian spy satellite. Uh, knocked down one of the Iridium satellites in the year 20, I want to say, 2009. Um, the, Russians, the Russians have done that more than once. They have these, um, I forget what they call their, uh, their spy satellites, but um, uh, they just moved a spare. They have a, they have an or, a spare orbit, and uh, took them about two months to steadily move the spare to where it was in the, what they call it being in the box. You're in the, the box where the satellite's supposed to be, and then they just keep them all in the box. The Mission Control Center in uh, Lansdowne, Virginia, is a very interesting place because if you make a remark about GPS, they go, ah, GPS, GPS. Oh, what a snooze fest it must be to work at GPS, you know. 
you know, those, the, those stupid geostationary satellites. You know, they're very, like, they're very proud of, like, what skill it takes to run the Iridium satellites compared to those Colorado Springs jokers who run the GPS satellite. You know, it's like you get into all this, like, uh, you know, satellite guy uh, gossip, you know. <laughs> Hi, Fred Powers. I'm a just retired uh, ex-engineer, lawyer, saxophone player, and so on. But the question is about money. Given the enormous amount of money it took to put the constellation up, and the fact there's still a lot to be replaced, I think Iridium last year is doing about 400 million a year, and their net worth is about one and a half billion, which ain't chicken feed, but Given that they had a lot of trouble raising money in the past, where will they get the capital for the well, that's satellites? Very interesting question. It's going to cost three billion dollars to put up the uh, next generation, and um, uh, they they had they, what they did is they put out bids saying, um, if you want this business to build the new constellation, um, uh, you have to also bring us the financing for the new constellation. And so it came down to um, a competition between, um, uh, it wasn't Boeing, what was the American company was Boeing, and um, uh, how, how do you pronounce, Talis, Talis Alenia, which is the big European uh, satellite company. It's French. And so, uh, the, the, the French banks have an organization called, or the French government has an organization called COFACE. I don't know what it stands for, C-O-F-A-C-E. And it's similar to our Export-Import Bank. And they said, we'll put up 95% of the money as a low-interest loan to Iridium if you use Tale Selenia. Well, Boeing tried to get... Um, uh, the Im Export Import Bank to do the same thing in the in the U.S. and they said, we don't give money to American companies. We give money to foreign companies that want to invest in America. Why should we give money to an American company that's going to make a deal with another American company? And so the Export Import Bank in America said, no, we refuse to do that. And so it was a no-brainer. The French get the contract. All the satellites were built in uh, Toulouse, and um, uh, the, and, and it's been, they did a great job. The satellites work brilliantly. They haven't had a single failure. Um, and uh, the, French, see, the French have always wanted to, they've always resented the American dominance in space. And they've always tried to develop their own industry. And they've done a very good job of it over the years. And they're the leading space uh, nation in Europe. And um, so this was a major victory for them. <laughs> and of course, Iridium was happy, 95% you know, of the money. Yeah, we can come up with 5%, you know, through our cash flow. And, uh, but it should, even paying off the loans, it should uh, be cash flow positive by about the year. Um, they should have the loans totally paid off. And then it's just a money machine after the year 2028. Uh, Tom Hazlett, uh, could you tell us a little bit more then about the business? You said there are about a million phones. Is that a million subscribers? In addition to the handsets, um, are the airplanes customers? And uh, they have all kinds uh, of customers. Uh, m much of many of the customers today are called B two B, business to business. Uh, there's no human involved. It's a, it's a, uh, for example, International Harvester now installs in every piece of big equipment that they sell, an Iridium transceiver. Transceiver meaning it can send and receive. Um, pe people never understand this. People don't understand that, you know, when you're, when you're on that flight, to, flight from New York to Paris and you're looking at the little map that they have on the back of the seat, <laughs> you think that somebody can see you in Paris or New York. No, they can't. <laughs> you know where you are. 
but um, as soon as you pass Gander, Newfoundland, you're off the grid, and you don't come back onto the grid until you're in Ireland. And so there's these huge parts of the ocean uh, where um, um, nobody can see you. So um, the, the iridium transceiver can uh, uh, send information and get information back. Um, uh, you've always had uh, devices that can collect information and you gather it later. But in, real, in terms of real-time information, these little devices, they put them on whales, uh, and when the whale comes up out of the water, they know where the, they know, they not only know where the whale is, they know what the temperature is of the, the, the whale's body temperature, and uh, I think, you know, 10 or 15 other medical things about the whale. I mean, that's how sensitive some of these instruments are. Now, Iridium doesn't make those apps. They just provide the, the, uh, the platform for the app to work. And so it has many, many scientific applications like that. Um, I think, I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but I think about 60% of their business is still voice. Now, some people buy the phone just for emergencies. So they have special plans. You can buy a phone, and if you don't turn it on, then it's just 20 bucks a month. As soon as you turn it on, you, st you start paying $1.50 a minute or something like that, a dollar a minute, something like that. If you, because it's for an emergency. It's for when you have no other means of communication. And many government agencies use it that way. The, f the Federal Reserve keeps um, several hundred <laughs> phones. <laughs> I guess in case of like international money panics or something, you know, it's like if, if you can't talk to the central banks around the world, um, you have those Iridium phones, you get that central banker on his Iridium phone and you talk to him and you figure out, you know, how to stop the worldwide depression or whatever. <laughs> they have these, they have all these nightmare scenarios and at the end of the scenario is, well, we'll have this many Iridium phones <laughs> in case of this nightmare scenario. So, it's the, it's the phone you buy when it's the only option. Oh really? Um, there's also an there's a there's a phenomenon called iridium flare that um, astronomers enjoy. Um, when when uh, at least once every two days, uh, a, an iridium satellite will come in into such a relation with the sun that it creates a bright streak like a meteor. Uh, it's like uh, 90 times brighter than Venus or something. And um, uh, if you have the app, it's a free app, uh, you, you know when the, when the uh, uh, iridium flare will take place and where it will be in space. So my favorite thing that people do is, like, if, if you have some clueless person, you can, um, you can make up a, <laughs> you, you, you can make up some kind of outer space alien story you know, and and uh, and tell them it's going to happen, and they just they're going to see the giant meteor, and you'll know exactly when it's going to happen. So they use it to prank people a lot, but um, uh, that will no longer be true once all the second generation satellites are up because they, you know, have a different coating and it's not going to reflect the same way. The I don't know the rate, but the rate. Uh, the number of subscribers goes up um, every year, as uh, mostly because more and more apps are developed and things like there's a there's a global hotspot you can get an iridium hotspot, so uh, you can't stream YouTube with that hotspot, but you can get your email, you know. So if if you're if you're planning a trip to the Arctic Circle, and you want to get your email, that hotspot will work. Um, uh, uh, it would not. It would not work for anything extremely um, dense, like like uh, stream, streaming video. I mean, it, you could try, but I don't. I don't think it would work. Anybody else? Yes, the second generation has um, uh, what they call. Um, uh, uh, high-speed broadband, 
it's not what, uh, you know, it's not, it will never be as high, because of the distance, it will never be as high speed as what, what you can get terrestrially. Now, many companies have tried to do various ways to deliver high speed broadband by satellite. None of them have ever been successful. Um, Elon Musk has a plan to do that with something like, I, mean, I think he said 4,000. He wants to put up 4,000 satellites in various orbits that are going to provide broadband to Earth. I mean, I talked to one of the guys that works at that company. It's at a very, 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 very early stage. I can guarantee you that. But Elon Musk talks about it like it's, you know, they're going to do it next year or something. They're definitely not going to do it next year. Um, um, uh, there, the, uh, Facebook has looked into various plans to deliver high-speed broadband. But the best way to deliver high-speed broadband is from a much, much lower orbit than this, than the Iridium orbit. The problem is, if you're within 100 kilometers of the surface of the Earth, you're in the airspace of that nation. Outer space starts, it's called the Kármán line. At the Kármán line, that's the definition of outer space. It's 100 kilometers up. If you're under 100 kilometers, which is what you need to be if you're really going to provide great broadband, um, then you have to get permission from all of the 212 countries in the world or whatever, and you've got to make deals with all those 212 countries, and uh, they've got to agree to cooperate with the other 212 countries. It's a United Nations-type uh, regulatory uh, nightmare. Now, Motorola was able to do it because Motorola had lobbyists all over the world. And they were a huge company that could do things like that. And I have a whole chapter in the book about the, the, <laughs> the treacherous politics at the uh, uh, international conference where they uh, award spectrum um, and uh, all of the spying that went on and, uh, and the uh, dirty, dirty dealing that went on. Uh, and Motorola could do that. I don't know if there's any com com uh, com company today, maybe maybe Google, you know, and maybe Facebook, and they they both have plans to do some kind of. Google is doing balloons, and uh, I talked to the balloon guy, and he it was very impressive. I mean, it's very impressive what those balloons can do, and they solve many of the problems. The the three iridium guys originally thought of balloons and and considered balloons, and uh, they discovered that they would bunch up. In, in the atmosphere. They, you couldn't keep them far enough apart. Um, Google claims to have solved that problem <laughs> and claims to have a way to put up these uh, balloons uh, uh, around the world that can deliver broadband. Uh, that's also in an early stage, though. Um, face, the Facebook Connectivity Lab has a, has a project for drones um, that's similar. Uh, so there are plans to try to deliver high-speed broadband, um, but uh, none of them are very far advanced. Okay. Please join me in thanking our speaker.